Good to see you all uh, on Zoom once again. My name is Mike Scott. I'm the program director here for an exciting class around French cassoulet with, with Terry Kelzer, whom many know and uh, we're delighted to always have the opportunity to be with you, Terry, from your own kitchen. So thanks for that. Um, our mission is to build local food culture and we do that through building community and supporting conservation and teaching the crafts around local food, whether that's growing or preserving or cooking and presenting good food from local farmers and all that that entails in terms of building healthy soil and water. So Terry's been in the area for many years and really kind of homesteaded out here in the Amory area. She knows a lot about growing her own food, including raising animals together with her family and really embodies a lot of what Farm Table's about. Terry, it's delightful to have you here. Yeah. Terry, feel free to say more about yourself as a years as a chef with Head Start and, and a, a local celebrity within the uh, culinary field. <laughs> <laughs> welcome, everybody. Hi, welcome, everybody. Welcome to Cassoulet. I think that's the way Julia Child would always present it, Cassoulet. And um, uh, about myself, um, we've been here on the farm for almost 50 years now and I started out as a city girl and really got an education here and learned all about uh, cooking from scratch, from raising our animals and, and taking them all the way to these wonderful dishes that you can make with them. Um, a cassoulet is, um, I had first some little information that I always like to present and a couple of stories that I hope you'll enjoy. They're favorites of mine. There is no dish in Southwest France more iconic, cherished, and controversial than the cassoulet. The history of the cassoulet is the history of the Department of the Land of Southern France. It is a simple assemblage of ingredients that were available, white beans, pork, sausage, confit, cooked together for a long time. The birth of the cassoulet, the story goes, happened during the siege of Castanudari by the Black Prince, Edward Prince of Wales in 1355, during the Hundred Years War. The besieged townspeople gathered together their remaining foods to create a big stew cooked in an open cauldron. The preparation of the stew was a success as the townsfolk were fortified enough to repel the English invaders. Much of the city had been sacked, hundreds of villagers murdered, but the city was saved from occupation. So it is the life of the famous bean stew begins in the town of Castanudari with two other nearby towns known for it as well. Carcassonne, the fairy tale walled city, and Toulouse. During the hunting season, the Carcassonnes will throw in several red partridges and some lamb shoulder. In Toulouse, it is enriched with confit of goose, pork skin, and sausages. Although it is essentially a humble stew of beans and meat, cassoulet is a cause of much drama and debate. Andrew Doggan, famous chef of Gascony, cassoulet is not really a recipe, it is a way to argue among neighboring villages. Much like chili cook-offs in Texas, cassoulet cooking competitions are held not only in France, but now in the United States, where cassoulet has become quite popular. The sanctity of cassoulet is taken so seriously in France that there is a brotherhood, the Grand Coffre of cassoulet that defends the glory and the quality of cassoulet in Castanudari, in part by conducting surprise taste tests for local chefs, which I'm sure is a delightful to see them coming. And there is an Academy of Cassoulet whose members promote the Cassoulet and its significant cultural heritage. Still, it is popular throughout the whole of France. A writer stated that the Cassoulet he ate at Chef's Clemence in Paris had been cooking for 20 years on the stove, water, beans, and meat replaced daily. 
The casserole is the cooking dish that is traditional. And I have a picture of it here. It's made from the clay soil around Castellinari. They're still being made all these hundreds of years later, and they're a little bit pricey. Maybe if you're gonna enter a castle contest, it might be worth $175 to you. The important thing to remember is that you want a, a deep pan, and I found this um, clay proof that, which is perfect and quite a bit more reasonable. <laughs> and it's, uh, it, it's important that it's deep and that it has a length to it and if it has handles is really nice. These come with covers, but um, you won't be using your cover while you're cooking your cassoulet. Um, love is like a good cassoulet. It needs time and determination. Some bits are delicious while others might make you wince. You, are, you may even come across an odd surprise, like a little green button. It should not be off-putting. Many hands putting a dish together, life happens. You must always consider the dish as a whole. As I've, the ingredients vary from region to region, and I just have two little short, sto two short stories. There was a cassoulet prepared with many fresh ingredients, but with a sausage seemingly well preserved, but from 10 years previous. This sausage was added to a cassoulet served to a Patrice, Patrice Baudin, the town pharmacist, who they wrote had never previously shown any signs of lunacy. It turned her into a vegetarian it was a scandal from which the village never recovered. Then there is the story of Madame Ladrissat and Madame Moreau. Madame Ladrissat spotted Madame Moreau in the local market buying tomatoes and asked her casually what she was making. The woman replied, cassoulet, and Madame Ladrissat recoiled in horror but tomatoes have not a place in cassoulet. Yes, they do. I always use tomatoes, replied Madame Rowe. The next thing you'll be telling me, you put a lamb in it as well. Don't be ridiculous. I would never commit such a perversion, Madame Rowe said. Ridiculous, you say. It is not I who puts tomatoes in a cassoulet. It is you. What does your husband think? He wouldn't have it any other way, she said, replied tersely. Moments later, several onlookers witnessed Madame Larissette striding up to Madame Moreau's husband, sitting on the bench by the fountain. Monsieur Moreau also looked up to see this woman coming toward him with a basket in hand, which his nose immediately told him was full of fresh fish. Monsieur, she began, forgive me, but it is a matter of utmost importance, and a true Frenchman like yourself will know the definitive answer. Should a cassoulet have tomatoes in it or not? Monsieur Moreau, so startled by her sudden appearance and line of questioning that he could think of nothing but the truth, he said, the correct method of cooking a cassoulet is always a source of contention. Personally, I prefer it without tomatoes, like my mother made it. But for God's sakes, don't tell my wife. According to witnesses, Madame Ladoucette walked straight back up to Madame Rowe and repeated the entire conversation, adding it was her civic duty to cook a cassoulet correctly. Precisely what Madame Rowe said to her in return witnesses failed to catch. There was no doubt about what happened next. Madame Ladrissette reached into her basket, pulled out an eel, and slapped Madame Moreau across her face. With it, before leaving its head, wedged firmly down her cleavage. She and stalking off, okay, she made it halfway down the street 
much to the delight of the villagers who couldn't have wished for better entertainment on their market day. Madame Moreau put her hand in her bag, picked out a tomato and hurled it at Madame Ladrissette. It landed with such force that her victim momentarily staggered. The pair never spoke again. From that day onward, Madame Moreau insisted on keeping a large bowl of tomatoes near her kitchen window, which she used as ammunition whenever her enemy passed. As the years went by, Madame's arm strength suffered and where the tomatoes landed was anybody's guess. In return, Madame Ladrissette retaliated with her best eel impression, which was never that good but had for several years been hampered by ill-fitting dentures. Such is the importance of proper ingredients. So those are my little stories that I so enjoy them. I hope you did too. Um, now we're gonna start with our processes for a recipe. And I wondered how Julia Child did this because it's really hard to have the bird and have the bird cooked and I only have one duck, so. Um, there are things that you do up to a week ahead, which can be dealing with the bird of your choice. It can be a duck, which is the most traditional, unless you're in Toulouse, and then it's a goose. Toulouse is known for their wonderful, um, wonderful Toulouse goose. Um, I love Toulouse um, geese. That was the kind we always had here on the farm and I'll share you a picture of my favorite goose later on. Um, so whatever bird you choose, and if geese and ducks are pretty expensive, you can certainly use a chicken. I've used a chicken for many years. Um, and you can take and cut off the legs and thighs of your bird of choice. Uh, then take, take the duck, take the goose, put it in a roasting pan and roast that separate. Uh, when, it's, when it's done roasting, you want to pour off all the fat and save it. In the meantime, you're going to take your, uh, your thighs and legs, and those are going to be brined for a day. We're going to, um, and, and say you only have chicken. And of course, this is how a modern chicken breast comes. There's virtually, there isn't, there's like so little fat that you can't believe it. Julia Child, when she's presenting with her goods and geese have so much fat and she does a segment where she renders it and she has this platter that is just heaped with the fat that she cut off of a single goose. Now, I don't know if, uh, a 2021 20, year goose because everyone has been so conditioned to fat is bad. This film was probably from 1960s, 1970s, and the birds were just, you could just pull all this fat out of the cavities. And, and now that just isn't possible anymore. So if you were using a chicken, and you, you would take your day to brine it and you you would use your um you know salt peppercorn some thyme and some garlic and rub it in and put a weight on put it in a container and this this is all nice flavoring and traditionally years ago this was salting process was also another preserving method and then then I would, I would make the confit. Now you can make a really nice confit with um, chicken, but you say I have no fat for it. Um, we're gonna just put in like a couple of little garlic for flavoring, maybe a little bit of shallot and um, pepper. And see now. I'm not gonna add any more salt. We'll say that the salt has been removed. And then we just put a couple of sticks of butter on top. And that is gonna melt down. Your thighs are gonna cook in this butter, nice and low and slow for a couple of hours. And it's just gonna come out the most delicious, tender, beautiful uh, chicken thighs that you've ever seen in your life. They're just, 
they taste so good. And you say, oh my gosh, all that fat, all that fat is going into my, my chicken. You can pour off the fat when you're done and you have almost exactly what you started with. The bird is not absorbing the fat. So I'm gonna pop this in and start a little chicken comedy. And then um, I will say that you have made your, your duck or your goose and you want to take the meat off of that and you could, uh, you will have dressed meat mostly, maybe some meat around the wings and underneath um, and take that and you could make yourself a nice duck dinner a week ahead, maybe some orange sauce and some uh, oven brown potatoes and salad. You can make duck riettes, which is um, which is taking, it's almost like making a pate where you take the meat and you shred it up and you pack it into a jar and then you pour your duck fat or your goose fat over that. And that is used like a pate and you can just scoop it out when you need it on a little French bread for a sandwich or a cracker. Um, and it's uh, considered a fair delicacy. And uh, so I, I guess that's the basic thing. You roast your bird, you, you save the meat off of that, you put your comfy in to cook. And then when it comes out, you wanna just store it in the fat until you're ready to use it. And of course, in traditionally in history, they would store their meat the whole winter that way in a semi-cool place. So um, the next thing is the beans. The beans are really the heart of the dish. And mm -hmm. I want to, um, we're gonna mm -hmm. soak the beans a day ahead of time. Okay. And I wanna show you, yes. Uh, two questions, one about the pot. Um, I have a Romer top glazed terracotta pot, would that work? She's showing it right there actually. Yes. Nell showing Great. it. Yes, yes it would. Beautiful, actually right. beautiful, yes. All right, and then another okay. question about, um, someone, Mary says, wait, what, that's what you do with the confit? Eat it smeared on bread? Um, no, no, that is, um, you have made your confit and that is separate. That's your legs and thighs. You still have more meat left on your goose or duck. You have the breasts. Breasts never, are made, made into comfy, never. Uh, and certainly not chicken breasts. They would be awful. They would be stringy. Um, you want thighs and legs. And um, then you, uh, th that's a separate process. What I'm talking about doing uh, the roulettes, roulettes um, is, is a separate process to use the meat that's left on your bird. You don't want to waste anything. Um, uh, certainly you wouldn't waste two nice pieces of breast meat and you could just want to have that for your dinner. Enjoy it just as it comes out of the oven. The way of preserving it for later is to shred it up, pack it in a jar, put the duck or goose fat over it and just refrigerate it, take it out and that's the part, just the breast meat that you would use to spread on a sandwich. Great, thanks, Terry. That sounds like Mary Kay got to, has that. Um, Glenn also has a quick question. What about an unglazed yep. terracotta roasting pan? Gosh, you know, I've not, I've not used that. Do you use it for other baking? If you use it for other baking, I don't see that that's a problem. Use we use it for uh, roasting. roasting chickens and stuff in. Oh, then it should be just fine. Okay, just discolor. It should be. Thanks. Yeah, I I don't see why that wouldn't work. And remember, people use what they had, they did them, and they do now. Use what you have. And just and so you know. Folks, oh, uh, also typed in a place to find cassoulet bowls in the, in the uh, chat box, just in case you want to check that out, crockettpottery.com. Oh, okay. Or you can go, yeah, I, you can go right to Castanari, France, and there, there, um, 
there online as well, and you can get it right from there. But the beans we are using are the tarbay bean. And I wanted just so you can see the size with the, um, this is a soaked navy bean, and this is a soaked tarbay bean. And the size you can see, um, this is a bean that really stands up to cooking. It is available, and uh, I was able to get it at um, from California, a nice organic uh, tarbay bean. Uh, so, and, and the thing about these beans are so sturdy, the cooking process is so long. And this here is my navy beans with just the soaking process, and some of them are already crumbling. So I just wanted wanted you to see the difference there. And then I had this also, which I think these would be fine. These are little tiger eye beans, they're called. And they're, um, they were grown locally by the uh, produce manager for Farm Table. And she um, they're beautiful little beans, but they're big enough. I think they're, all, they're like halfway between a navy bean and a tarbay. So I think, um, you know, use what you want, use what you have. And I've always used navy beans, but this year I was really wanting it to be traditional as I could make it. So then we talk a little bit about meat beans. Um, they should be fresh. And I want to explain to you because it seems like a, um, oxymoron or something you say how can how can um dried beans be fresh well you should know that a dry bean is considered fresh up until two years after harvest up until that point you can take that dry bean and walk out to the garden and put it in the dirt and water it and it will grow after two years germination is very very poor if at all and also the cooking time gets very much longer the older the bean to the point where some if they're old enough they may never soften at all so that's the thing to keep in mind that most beans that you buy they should have a date somewhere most of your dried beans so um, the next step would be after you're soaking your beans the day ahead you might want this would be a good time to roast your other meats so um, if I was, what I have done, you could take like a pork roast, some assorted sausages, whatever you like, and some thick sliced bacon. And I put it all together in a pot like this and I roasted it. After about an hour, I took out the sausages and the bacon and then uh, continued to let the roast uh, finish cooking. And then took all of that out and put in a container and then was very careful to save all of those wonderful meat juices which we will put into the cassoulet as well it, the whole thing about what, what you're making is every step you're thinking the flavors uh, starting with uh, brining your uh, your chicken your duck your goose you're adding flavors to it when you're doing your your you're taking your soap beans then and then we have like these are the navy beans soaked and then you would just follow the recipe by adding and you want to save your save your bean water now i know i've been told you know over the years it's been common to drain off the water and so you don't have gas etc um but it, there's a whole lot of good minerals in in the water that you use to soak your beans. So it's it's very healthy if you can do that and save the bean water and then put in the other ingredients, the onion, the carrots. Now, I went through hundreds of recipes, I think, for cassoulet, and I found not a single one that didn't have some tomato, either uh, a big scoop of tomato paste, some fresh tomatoes, um, so, uh, you know, I don't, I think Madam um, would be a little upset with us, but <laughs> I'm using tomatoes and I, I have seen um, Michelin chefs put in tomatoes fresh from the garden when they're 
available and tomato paste when it's not. So if, if, then you would follow the recipe that I gave you with your beans and then um, add some chicken duck or goose stock that you have to them and a cup of white wine and then put those on the stove to cook. And I would cook them in a pot, certainly not a bowl. And this has been cooking to the point where it's done now that you can probably see. And I'm going to do the process of arranging the castle egg. Now in, I believe it, yes, it would be in Toulouse, they would line the bowl with pork skin. That's very traditional. It might be one of the bits you're not ready to go for. Um, and then you start the process with your meats. And I'm going to get those right here. My roasted meats. And I've just done half. I want to keep this bottom board clean. So. So you want to cut up your pork and I have here, what I used was an extra thick pork chop, which works really nice as well if you didn't want to do the whole roast. And we're going to take that and layer it in our pan at one end. And then we're going to take some sausages. I have smoked sausages and unsmoked sausage. These are what Peterson Farms. Um, that uh, are available at farm table as well. And I'm going to put my sausages in the bottom on the side. And yeah, I might as well use them all. And then I have bacon. And I'm going to just cut that a little bit, pieces, and put that in. I have a couple of my sausages. Looks like it'll take it. Now I'm going to leave that. That'll be much too long. All right. All right. All right. Now we've got our beans that have been cooked to just done. And we're going to ladle the bean mixture over our meats and you can pull out the bay leaf and you leave in the carrots. We pull out our little garni boku, which is our, um, our herbs that we put in a little cheese cloth. Give you that. Okay, and we'll add, we'll just continue to add this up. I had, instead of an onion, I used a leek and I'm going to go ahead and put that in. And then I'm just going to layer it, the rest of the beans in. So we have the meat on the bottom and our beans and tomatoes on the top. And then we want to pour in some of this nice flavorful liquid. And we want to add some more. I'm going to add some of our, this is the brown brown bits from the bottom of my roasting pan. I'm going to add those in. Just, just this wonderful thick brown sauce. Just beautiful. 
Perry, we've got a question. Uh, Levi asked, how long do you roast a pork chop compared to other things like a roast? Um, I, it, you know, the oven's 300. I left it for a couple hours, hour and a half, two hours. Um, it wasn't too long. So I'm going to finish all the beans. And these have cooked a couple hours, at least two to three hours already. And then we're going to cook them two to three hours more. Now, saving the juices, you will add juice as you go along. It will eventually it will start to uh, form a crust and you, you tap through the crust and then you add, add broth up to the top, you know, so it's nice and juicy. Now, we don't usually put our duck leg on until the end. I had two duck legs, so one is in the oven. Uh, usually you would have at least a couple on the top and those would go in at the uh, last hour of cooking. And then the top, the, the skin will get nice and crackly brown and crispy. And you also put some of the wonderful duck fat right into your dish as well. And not to forget a cup of wine. What could be better? I don't know. Nothing. Um, save the juice. But now um, I'm not going to put this in this dish quite yet. And this one is ready for the oven. Now I'm going to take out my finished one. We can't quite eat all this. There's only three of us. So this one may go to the freezer. I'll type in your address shortly here and we'll be over soon. <laughs> So I'm going to, oh, first I'm going to show you this, uh, our thighs, how they're doing here. And perhaps you can see the butter is melting and covering them completely. And they're just um, very gently cooking. And so you can see they're completely covered with fat. Not a bad thing. Now here is our finished dish. And maybe I will have Nubia move the camera so that we can actually just see what it looks like. And we'll try not to make anybody seasick here. But you can see this is browned and crispy and just the way it's supposed to be. And the, the beautiful beans and our meats. That's just the way it's supposed to be. be. Cassoulet. This is cooked two to three hours already in the oven. And the duck, the duck thigh there, Terry, you just put that in for maybe the last hour? For the last hour. And, and right on top, and it got all nice and crispy and tender and delicious. Oh my gosh, look at that. The lovely duck meat. So tender and soft. Just beautiful. Now, we have this done. I'm going to set it aside. I'm going to push our concrete back in the oven. And I'm going to put together for you uh, some go -whiz. Um Very traditional, all over France is their carrot salad, uh, especially maybe in the winter. It's everywhere. And I think it's wonderful with this dish. Mary, Mary Kay asks, have you been to France and, and had cassoulet there or other places? And how was that? I haven't. Maybe one day. Let's go. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> sounds good. 
Now we're going to put our pond of carrots in a bowl. I'm going to sprinkle some parsley. It's winter. I don't have fresh parsley. I, I have two chopped up scallions and I'm going to put those in. Take off. Kind of mix that a little bit. And we're going to make a simple dressing. With, um, let's see, we have a teaspoon of Dijon mustard. Got too big a spoon. You know, it's dressing, it's not exact. And we have honey, a tablespoon for, let's see, how much honey are we? One to two teaspoons of honey. This is nice local bees knees honey. I think that's from St. Croix Falls. You can get that at Round Table also. We're gonna mix our mustard and honey a little bit. I've got a juice of a lemon here. I'm gonna put in and about equal amount of I'm gonna put some olive oil in there. Mix it up. A little bit of salt. And I'm just going to pour that over our carrots and mix that up. And then I'm going to taste it. I think it needs just a little more kick to that than that. I'm going to add just a little wine vinegar. That's just such a simple and totally classic salad. And then I will show you the bread we're going to have. Today is um, Bugatti. This is kind of the French equivalent to focaccia bread or ciabatta. I mixed up the dough this morning. I can't make that pan there. Then I won't have to move it. This is a traditional olive bread, flat bread. Although you can make one, I make a sweet cherry one as well. That's really, really good. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to press this out into an oval. And then I'm going to cut it. We're going to make a slice down the center. And then we're going to cut little wedges like so. You're supposed to make like a leaf. Then I sprinkle it with some olive oil. Just kind of, and then maybe with a little sprinkle of salt. We'll let that rise just about 10, 15 minutes and then bake it for about 20 minutes. This is the one I made this morning. And this is how it turns out. And it's really, really good. And uh, the recipes for this and um, 
for our gathering here tonight. I also made us a nice little cream brulee. Do you want to grab a couple of those little cups up there in the fridge? And I can send you recipes for the fugazi bread and the um, creme brulee if you're in the mood to make it. It's certainly an easy thing to make. And I always think it's uh, when you're doing French, it's a great thing. I'm gonna Grab a little sugar here. Sprinkle on the top. And I think in the words of Julia Child, every woman must have a torch. One of my favorites. And so we're just going to turn it on. And your cream brulee is just, uh, you just warm up some heavy cream and a separate dish, eggs, and a little bit of sugar. Creme brulee is not really ultra, ultra sweet. Here you're making a nice little crisp crust on the top. That's all. Um, so, that's kind of going to be our dinner and hand me one of the big plates and I'm going to plate this up. going to do is we're going to reach down and get some some slices of our pork roast some bits of bacon some sausages a carrot oh and then I promised everyone the French secret or not for keeping away the winds is to take your dish at the table. There usually be a vinegar bottle on the table. This is some nice organic wine vinegar. And then just give it a splash. We'll add a little bit of carrot salad. Mary, what kind of sausages did you use? I used um, a smoked sausage from Peterson Farms that um, we sell at Farm Table. I believe it's um, I believe it's a pork sausage. Um, some of those had pork and lamb together, and uh, and then I just had a plain like a bratwurst sausage, and then some nice thick sliced bacon. And I will cut wedges. Did you say that's a, a splash of red wine vinegar? Yes. Okay. And then this is our focaccia bread. Or not focaccia, fugazi. It has olives in it. It has finely chopped olives, black olives. And this is a very traditional plate. <laughs> Castellet. Are there more questions? Not yet. Uh, feel free to unmute yourself too, folks, if you'd like to just interject a question. Sure. Get in, yeah. Yeah, like where? What time is dinner, and what's the address? <laughs> <laughs> dinner is now. <laughs> so okay. Good. <laughs> yeah. That is beautiful. It is gorgeous. So the entire baking time is the pan is uncovered. Yes. And you want it to cook down and it gets nice and dark on top. And that's your sign that it's done. 
Did you ever use breadcrumbs with it on top? Oh, the breadcrumb story. Now that's considered to be an American edition because Americans don't like to wait for the browning of the top. Okay. And how, <laughs> often do you, how often do you make this? I mean, for me, that would be oh. maybe once every three years. Okay. <laughs> yeah, once, a, once a year. Okay. Once a year. I, you know, you it's a winter. It's a winter thing, you know, it's something really hearty and warming. Yeah, looks great. And it's really peasant food, you know, that people have survived on for years and years, hundreds of years. Yes. Terry, do you, while you're cooking, do you ever have to add more fluid? You know, yes, an hour into yeah. it. Yes, definitely. And you do add like every hour, you want to check it and see if it seems the slightest bit dry and then pour in some more broth for pour in some of your juices that you save in the bean dish. Um, yeah, keep it. Keep adding liquids as you go. That is traditional as well. So you will check it every hour at least. And Terry, what does confit mean? Is it is it literally something it's, like cooked in fat? Confit actually means preserve, the French word for preserve. And I do have, um, I'll show you my, I consider this to be the all time world's best book on cassoulet, Kate Hill. This is stories that she's written about Cassoulet, and she's, um, I think she's lived in France for the past 20 years, and she tries Cassoulet everywhere. She, she writes on, on, on um, Cassoulet every which way that you can make it, and the sausages, and the pottery, and uh, it's a wonderful book if you're really into Cassoulet. And then also this book, it, I don't know how many people know of this book, but it's a wonderful book. It kind of goes through the myth that fats are bad for you. Yes, some fats are bad for you, but the fats that we're talking about, um, duck fat is probably the healthiest fat of all. It's all monounsaturated fat. This fat that is does not harden at room temperature. It also contains, um, because your ducks and geese are out eating grass and weeds, that also gives it a, an extra element of omega-3 fatty acids in it. I took out my picture that I took. I like to share my, this is my goose. And this is a Toulouse goose. This was the kind, the breed that we raised and she's sitting on her eggs. And it's just one of my favorite pictures in the world. And I, I, uh, my artist friend saw it and she drew it for her Christmas card. She liked it so much. But a Toulouse duck is, our goose is, it kind of has a, like a grayish tint to it. Uh, this, these goose, geese are um, really gentle and, and sweet. They are, I have a story about, um, though, the moms usually sit on their eggs and hatch out the little ones. And we had a, a year that the moms, all three of them just walked away and left the little goslings half hatched out. There were six of them, but there were more eggs in the nest. And we thought, well, what the heck? And the gander, he came in and he took over and he raised them by himself. And the girls were off doing whatever they wanted. For some reason, they weren't interested in the babies at all. And he raised them up. And they're always just a beautiful, um, beautiful uh, animal. And really one of the hardest for me to butcher because, I, you know, you would hold it and it would just lay its head over your shoulder. And so I would feel bad about that. Um, but they were raised for meat. And except the, except the, the main layers and the gander that we kept for years and years and years. 
So um, this is a really good book. It also uh, talks about butter and how the French eat a lot of animal fats and a lot of duck fat. And over the years, they concluded that the reason they didn't have heart disease compared to people in the US was because of the glass of red wine. Now, over the years, they've concluded that it probably wasn't the red wine, it was the duck fat that was more protectant than the red wine could be. So something to keep in mind, you know, it's just that people have been so brainwashed that fat is bad for you. And then now these years we're learning that you really need it if you're going to keep your wits about you. Um, it's brain food. And basically, if you get yourself good fats, good butters, good duck fat, um, good raised lard that's not hydrogenized, as most everything in the store is, but just clean rendered and preserved. And this is a good fat also, and great for pie crust. And um, I'm going to be doing uh, so, uh, our next class is uh, dinner pies, and we're going to be making uh, hot crust um where we use lard and you do everything the opposite you've ever been told with uh, a pie crust which everything should be cold and butter and folded in and this we're using hot melted lard and it's uh, pretty fun and interesting Harry, uh, someone did ask about the wine too what wine are you serving or maybe the wine you put in the dish i'm not sure what the question is but uh, I just used a good white wine. Right now, um, I love Rodney Strong. And Rodney Strong from the uh, Russian River Valley, this will be the wine we serve with this meal. It's usually served with a red wine. And this is a Pinot Noir. Uh, and if you see Russian River Valley, and it's less than $30, grab it. It's really awesome. It, it's, was it good, Joe? Mm -hmm. He's doing this. Um, so uh, there's still left for us. So, And then I, I used just a uh, Rodney Strong um, uh, ca uh, Sauvignon, ca uh, Sauvignon Blanc for the, for the beans. And you could use, you could just use uh, half a cup of vinegar. I've seen that done too. And to your point, uh, Terry, about healthy fats and oils, one of our other instructors who teaches for us quite often, as I mentioned in the chat box, will be teaching a class on using the right fats and oils and how that actually, you know, how to cook with them, but also how it can be an important part of maintaining your health. Very good. I'm all for that. Terry, I, I, I don't know much about, um, tangine cooking, but it, this reminds me a little bit of, of that. And I think Moroccan cooking influenced French cooking. So very much. much so. And the south of France is, of course, very close and to Spain and um, yeah, Morocco. Uh, tangine, you know, I had, I, I thought I have a tangine. Actually, I think I left it at the farm table. And the only th reason that I couldn't use it is because it has this uh, top that kind of, you know, it goes up like this, but then you couldn't cook it with it upside down, it would fall over. Uh, but along the same idea, and it's good and thick pottery that has been glazed. And I thought, I thought of that at one time also that it would work, but of course not. I wonder, because the main dishes. I was just gonna say, I wonder, yes. I have just one more random question. Sometimes I like going gluten-free do you think that bread could could be could be made GF? Um, maybe, maybe not. I guess I'm not the I guess I'm not the person to give you advice on that. Right. I don't do the, the gluten free bakery items. I think they have gotten better in the years, and uh, if there is like a flatbread recipe that you know of, you could. I'm sure chop in olives and sure. use olive oil. Yeah, yeah, thank you. 
and I'm Lisa, sure it would work. Lisa, one of the interesting things about, um, as you, I don't know if you've heard about the story of the, of the flower that we use at Farm Table, mm, but it's, heritage. it's um, yeah, Sunrise Flour Mill. And at least some people who have trouble with gluten don't have trouble with their flowers. Uh, and they presume it's partly because it's organic and partly because it's also its heritage. So it's not hybridized and it's not, you know, gly glycosate, which is using Roundup, you know, isn't, isn't on it. And so, I don't know, there's, there are quite a few stories on their website about that kind of flower. Um, yeah. And I, I use that. Yeah, and you, did you use that for what you made there, uh, Terry? Mm -hmm. Yes, I Yes. And Mary Kay, also, of... Mary Kay also wants to say, let us know when you're ready to lead a trip to France. <laughs> that would be awesome. <laughs> yeah. I'll be the bag carrier. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely. It should happen. I what other questions do folks have about any of the things that, that Terry may have, you know, made tonight, whether it's the creme brulee or back to the, uh, the, the cassoulet? Any other questions, feel free to type them in or or unmute yourself. I want to know if that bread is, uh, like if you thump it, is it kind of hard and dense or is it crusty or thump it? No, it's soft. Oh man, look at that. It has, you know, it's a little chewy on the outside, okay. but it's soft. Uh -huh. Okay, thanks. Wow. And the recipe really that I sent out, Terry, it had the cassoulet as well as the carrot. I'm not the right. carrot salad, and may have had the creme brulee. I'm not sure. I... No, I it didn't have the creme brulee or the bread. Okay. And I can I have those recipes, and I'll send them off, and then you can send them off to okay. folks. Okay. So is cassoulet now seen kind of as a delicacy? You mentioned it's peasant food, but is it now? It, kind of I, there or no? It seemed more as a um, food of interest. I, you know, maybe the farm tables should have cassoulet cooking contests if they're becoming a thing. <laughs> that might be fun to see because of all the various nice beans and nice sausages and animals that are being raised that they use at the farm table. I think it might be a fun idea. Well, I think we have maybe 15 people here who might want to enter. Yeah. <laughs> Sounds good. Not me, however. <laughs> <laughs> I had to learn what confit was tonight for the first time. So it's, oh, it's well, a way to- You know, it. it's not, not done much anymore these days. Um, historically, that was, you had to preserve your food and it worked. Uh, you know, we don't even think that it's possible that you can just, uh, maybe you put it down in your cellar, you just cover it up with bats and make it as airtight as you can. And basically it kept for sure all winter. Our lady who got the 10 year old sausage, now I don't know <laughs> if there probably was something wrong with that. 10 years might be a bit long to hold something. Did you ever use that method uh, on the farm when you were raising a lot of animals, Terry? I didn't, mm -hmm. I didn't at all. I, we were so busy, we had so much to do. We had 5,200 goats at a time. We had usually six calves that we raised with the goat's milk. We had um, usually for sure 100 chickens for butchering, we butchered for the whole family, my husband's extended family. We had some geese. We had some guineas, but we never caught any of them. <laughs> so I don't know whatever happened to them. And and then we always had two or three pigs to butcher in the fall. And we raised those on goat's milk as well. Because when we came here in 1972, and my husband wanted goats. It was something you could raise when you didn't have a really big farm. Goats don't need pasture, they just need browse. Um, so 
it was like something on a small scale. We started with five goats and my husband was one never to do anything small. And before we know it, we had 50 to 100 goats on hand. All the milk, we fed runty pigs. We fed young calves. I made cheese um, and we drank the milk. And the pigs drank the milk. Yeah. So we used everything on the farm. I did have one little um, boy, one family that came to the farm to get goat's milk was a very strict vegetarian family. And one day they asked me if I would take care of them for the morning while the mom had errands to do, and then they would stop back and get their milk. And so I went out to the garden. I was working in the garden and the little fellow, he was maybe three years old, came with me and we were pulling weeds and things. And then I looked over to him and here he was, this little vegetarian boy, picking up June bugs and eating them. <laughs> I thought, oh dear, <laughs> he's off his diet. <laughs> All kinds of funny things happen on the farm. Well, at least the mother couldn't have blamed you for that. I know. I never said a word. <laughs> <laughs> and he grew up strong and healthy. So, Anyone else want to chime in? Anyone else have something they'd like to ask? Well, I hope I hope that it was something um, of interest to everyone. I hope it made it um, interesting. Absolutely, but folks are typing in thanks to you, Terry. And uh, as you can tell, folks, this sort of class may only last an hour, hour and a quarter. But Terry's been working for a long time to make one that's done now and others to be halfway ready and so on and so on. So Terry, thank you for your generosity in, in preparing. And- yeah, uh, got to take it three days to a week, <laughs> you have to. And folks, you'll probably know, those of you who've been in classes before anyway, we'll, we'll uh, get this out on a video recording soon. So you can always watch and refer back and you'll have the recipe there and if you have a question, feel free to email me and I can get it on to Terry and she can she can address those just like um, we had the one about what it means to pick, you know, what where you find the fat now on birds these days. So yeah, and I would say one further thing on rendering as what I said, like the old um, the old film with Julia Child, she had so much fat to render. And even with the locally bought duck, there isn't that much visible fat. And so actually the rendering that you end up doing is just by roasting it and it self renders the fats come out. And then by taking, the, when you pull back the skin on a duck or a goose, you can see the beneath the skin and where the meat starts, there's another layer of fat. And then so that when you take the carcass and cook it for broth, you take the skin too, and you have that extra layer of fat that um, chickens do not have. Chickens are not waterfall. Ducks and geese are waterfall. And even though they've been moved to the barnyard, they never lost that need for fat under their skin um, to protect them from the very icy cold water. And so that's why they have more fat than a chicken. So Terry, once you roast that, let's say goose or duck, uh, you can gather that fat and use it to, as a confit preparation? Yep, it's all usable. You want to strain it. Actually, the skin, if you keep roasting it, you make your cracklings, if you like cracklings, things like that. But yes, for sure. Okay. okay. All right. Well, thank you, Terry, and thank you, everyone, for joining us. Um, we wish you all well and stay healthy and safe and warm. And uh, okay. in, a month, in a month, Terry has a class on, uh, yeah, the dinner pie. He's going to teach three different dinner pies. Uh, but other classes coming up as well. Um, so keep an eye on our website. Thank you everyone for joining us and have a good evening. Wonderful. Thank, Thank you, everybody. everybody.